Hello, Animanian here, and today we're going to be looking at a sponsored video today because I have personally paid Ryu Lad a 100 USD uh, for the permission to post her video on my channel here. So um, yeah, uh, this is a brilliant, brilliant workshop on how to create art from a really, really experienced artist. This pro this is part of the program which I am sponsoring. Uh, NSFW tutorials. So if you want to create an NSFW tutorial that's voiced and is 15 minutes plus, then reach out to me on the Discord below in the video description. Again, we also have an NSFW Blender Discord. Please see that in the video description below. And thank you so much. Uh, I'll take it away to Ryu. Okay, you should be able to see this now. Uh, all this newfangled tech and stuff like that. Okay, awesome. So. Uh, let's kind of jump into this then with uh, with what we're doing today. So this talk is mainly about staying consistent and how to strike gold. And what I mean by that is how to remain consistent, how to uh, find your niche, you know, all the stuff that people don't typically talk about. There's a lot of technical stuff that goes on, uh, especially around in the communities that we are, things like physics and all that kind of stuff. But this uh, this talk is primarily for people that are already making content, and I'll kind of touch on that in a, in a second. So, who am I? I am Roo, pronounced like kangaroo. Um, I was actually asked to do a talk here quite a while ago. I think this was like June of last year, but I never really got around the time uh, to do it. But uh, I'm now here doing this for, for all of you. Um, a little bit about me. I started making stuff, oh God, uh, it's been over half of my life now. Um, I started with Gary's Mod and then moved to to SFM and all that kind of stuff. And then finally Blender now. Is there sound? Can you hear me all right? Okay, good. <laughs> I thought someone was telling me that my, I was microphone muted. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all good. Um, yeah, I started NSFW stuff uh, June of last year, so almost a year now that I've been around and, and, and kicking and doing stuff. Uh, if anyone's wondering about my kind of right of play, if you know what that means, um, I've been an artist now for over half my life, like I said. Um, I started doing commissions and for graphics and some small stuff like that since I was like 13 or 14. Uh, I've tried most mediums and stuff like that, and... I've been exposed to a lot of people and a lot of artists in general. Um, you know, tons of mountains, pitfalls, problems that people have with work and stuff like that. So I'm primarily here to talk about how to smooth your ride as an artist and, and make the most of what you have. So as I said earlier, um, this talk is primarily for those who are already making stuff and are past the point of just starting out. So you've gotten the basics down, you've opened a Twitter account, you're doing all this stuff, and now you're making content. However, um, if you are still finding your feet or if you are still um, kind of coming together and formulating a plan and you haven't quite started yet, feel free to stick around. It's absolutely for you as well. Uh, you might gain some insight as to how the journey might go for you in the future. And being aware of those things is great because you kind of get to understand things before they happen. So let's kind of jump into this, shall we? Uh, here is what we're going to be talking about today, which is basically just, I'm here to teach you, you know, how to remain consistent, all that kind of good stuff. You can see here in the middle that this is uh, our table of contents. This Google slide that I'm reading from will be available to download and view at your own time once this workshop is done. So you'll be able to go through, you'll be able to click these things and skip and move around. Uh, apart from that, we're going to go at our own pace and uh, hopefully things go pretty, pretty well. So um, the ultimate goal of what I'm trying to do here with this workshop is to... Uh, a lot of people talk about upping your skill ceiling, but not a lot of people talk about upping your skill floor, which is your minimum quality of work. And a lot of what... Kind of, a lot of the information that I'm going to be putting out today is not necessarily to improve your work at the top end, but to raise the amount of quality the, between your minimum and your maximum. 
So you can afford to be a little bit lax and a bit more confident with the way that you handle your content. So let's kind of talk about that in, in, a, in a general sense. Um, oh, actually, before I forget, disclaimer, of course, I'm not the best Blender person ever. Absolutely, right? Um, I just have a pretty big art background perspective, so I have this kind of unique ability to talk about these things. Don't think of me as this absolute god of Blender and 3D and all this kind of stuff. I'm still learning these things much like you guys are. So uh, yeah, let's just kind of move on and get into it. So content. Um, how do people make good stuff, just in general? Uh, it's, it's a weird topic to think about, especially with, you know, a lot of people on Twitter nowadays, DeviantArt, Slushy, doesn't really matter where you are. Um, but the the main thing is is you know how do people do this, right? How how do how do people actually do this in in a general sense? So let's look at some stuff. Let's take a couple of artists from Twitter, and we'll we'll take a look at some of their content in general. So as you can see here, I have chosen six artists. There's three here and three on the next slide. And I'm kind of showcasing some of their work, some of the fantastic stuff that people have done on Twitter and around the uh, the kind of NSFW space. Um, we have obviously Bates to the left, we have Fugdrop in the middle, and Seven Graphics to the right. Uh, and also on the next page, we have Maze3D, uh, KissX, and the Raycake. All of these people are fantastic individuals. They make a lot of really cool content and a lot of really creative content as well. And the main thing is, especially with making content and stuff like that, is how the fuck people do this in general. And I see Rigid there. Yes, I did originally put Rigid in the in the slides, but everyone knows Rigid, I think. I think a lot of people don't quite know uh, some of the, not necessarily small, but the other people in the community. So how, how, how the fuck do people do this in general? You know, it, it's, it's a really big question. You might think um, you might think it's like this crazy behind the scenes thing where they have Blender open and they're blasting the interstellar music and all that kind of stuff, but I can guarantee you it's not. It's absolutely not. Uh, they are much like you and me. They have struggles, they have tribulations, they have good days and bad days and so on and so forth. So um, let's kind of jot this down in terms of this kind of stuff. In terms of their art, um, in terms of their art, say, you know, in the case of Kiss X or Seven, the people that I've shown, um, in your eyes, what would separate their work from yours? And feel free to make a list right now, uh, kind of jot down a couple of bullet points yourself, you know, what separates your work from their work? Just in a general circumstance. Now, I'll, I'll give you two or three minutes to kind of do that, jot a few things down. So let's have a look here. Actually, I'm going to open up the uh, the chat so I can have a look. Family friendly, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, R Rigid's organization of scenes is like crazy. I I'm actually starting to use that system now, and it's weird how well it, it works for the for the for the content. Yeah, yeah. So y you guys are kind of getting it. You guys are getting it pretty damn good. You know, it's the quality, it's the attention to details, it's the lighting, it's the composition, yada, yada, yada. So let's have a look. I'm betting most of you in general, you know, um, have put down a number of things that are relatively similar. So in terms of what traits do they share between themselves and other people? One, they have a style. You know, a lot of the time you can recognize a creator just by the way they produce artwork. Um, it's often that you can tell who's who when you look at a piece. Sometimes even the watermark is gone and you can tell who made that piece because their style is so prevalent in the works that they do. They have a niche, which if you don't know what a niche is, it's basically like a specific avenue of content, whether it be still images, animations, so on and so forth. 
Um, these artists know what their audience wants most of the time, and they cater to that to some level. Uh, many artists also choose to do whatever they want and inadvertently produce a niche in that kind of way. It's a little bit unintuitive, but it's basically like, I do whatever I want, therefore I create a niche. Um, they're respecting the source material. Uh, they're not taking these characters and doing something weird with them. They are making these characters, they're putting them in realistic or hyper-realized situations. Um, also, it's not strictly necessary, but you can get a lot of ideas and motivation from uh, mundane situations as well, which is important. A lot of the renders that we've just seen are normal everyday things, you know? Being in a bar, being in a pool, hanging out with other people, that kind of stuff. They have tailored environments as well, which is a big one. Um, the environment complexity can change how a piece is viewed in general, and I'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. Bates' representation of PG in the swimming pool, the swimming pool in the pool is completely basic. It's very, very simple, and it's not strictly pertinent to the piece that it's very detailed because she's the focus of that pinup. And that very much contrasts with someone like the Ray Cake because they spend a lot of time on those environments and they almost make mini stories within the renders that they do. So we have effective posing which is much like the environments, uh, a lot of the characters brought on through the use of posing. Depending on how you depict certain characters, they can be seen as confident, shy, depressed, or happy. Knowing how to pose someone's body language in a scene is just as important as posing their actions. You know, they don't need to be overly complex because simple poses can often become most of the good, like the really good looking stuff is often very simple. Lastly, multi-res sculpting. I'm sure a lot of you picked up on this as well. It's been kind of like a thing, like a wave that people have been going through recently. Um, every single render of theirs has some kind of detail work, even if it's absolutely minimal. Many people dismiss the importance of such sculpting because it can be taxing on your hardware or may it seem like it not matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, this will be covered in a little bit uh, further down the road. But if you are capable of sculpting, I do implore you to begin learning and deploying it ASAP because those smaller details really do matter. So, let's move on. What makes them popular? Now this is an interesting question because there's a lot of things that can make an individual popular. One, they make good renders. I think that's pretty obvious, you know? Uh, there doesn't need to be, be any more complicated than that. They just make good stuff. Secondly, they're consistent. They are posing regularly, uh, sorry, posting regularly, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, not all of it is finished pieces, but a lot of them are. And that consistency is key in the algorithm sometimes because the algorithm will anticipate them posting on specific days if they're consistent enough. They have a solidified quality to them. Yeah, uh, whips do fall into consistency. You may think that like posting a work in progress isn't that important, and you may want to forego that because it's not something that people will typically think about, but posting a whip in the meantime while you're finishing something larger does help with things because you're still posting stuff. It's audience engagement, like Nest said. So, solidified quality. As experienced artists, seven graphics and all that kind of stuff, their minimum effort, um, it's, it's about 90% of what their maximum effort is. I think there's a way to, to make it full screen. You'll have to check. Hang on. They've almost achieved a, a sense of artistic consistency with that kind of stuff. So they have a almost like a, a minimum quality and a maximum quality, and they're not too different from each other. So they can afford to be a little bit lazy sometimes and still produce good stuff, which is what I was talking about before. Uh, making this happen is super, super difficult. So don't expect yourself to achieve this anytime soon. It's one of those things where like five, six years down the line as an artist, you kind of get the hang of it and you start to solidify that kind of quality. Next is time scale. They spend time on the stuff that they produce, you know, depending on your follower count and what's expected of you, 
you cannot afford to spend time on big pieces like this because the algorithm sometimes will just shoo away an account because, you know, they don't have enough followers to only post monthly or something like that. For myself, for example, before I started doing weekly content, I would only post about once a month and the algorithm was pushing against that because I wasn't, I was spending time on my stuff, but there was also that big gap between each post that kind of faltered a little bit. Your mileage may vary. It always does with the algorithm, but typically um, it's important that you find that efficient balance between the, uh, you know, how much stuff you post, how much time you spend on it, that kind of stuff. Platform time. Simply put, they've been on the platform for longer than you. You know, that that's why they're popular. They've been here a lot longer. But this isn't always the definite case, right? There are many artists that are of better quality who don't have a fraction of the followers that other people do. Well, I'm about to pull the rug from underneath you a little bit here because there's only a couple things in this scene, in this set, that actually do make sense. Plot twists, I know, right? So in blue, we have absolutely matters. Green absolutely does matter as well. Orange only a little bit matters and red doesn't matter at all. So when we're talking about what makes them popular and what, what traits do they share as artists, we have to remind ourselves that it's not necessarily about how long they've been on the platform for or how the good content that they make. It's just typically that they have a almost a, a consistent schedule that they adhere to in any sense, right? So they're posting frequently, they're interacting with others, they are making good posts, but they're not spending ungodly amounts of time on one thing and then moving on, that kind of stuff. And I'm sure a lot of you might have put something down uh, in your comparisons between you and the other artists that turns out just doesn't matter in the uh, in, in the general sense. And that, that can be. A lot of people perceive things in such a way that they think, oh, you know, I'll never grow because I'm here five, six years too late. And that's absolutely not the case. You can always grow. Heck, I'm a living, breathing representation of that. I started last year and I have almost 4,000 followers now. It's kind of crazy. Uh, such a short amount of time and stuff like that. You can absolutely grow right now on the platform. And you don't have to worry about things about platform time or making absolutely astonishing renders that are perfect in every way. It's okay to just be consistent and good sometimes. So, moving on, how do we strike gold in, in this kind of circumstance? Oh yeah, that, that is a good point as well. I do have a, a note here. We'll kind of rewind a second. Um, it, in this instance, it's okay to compare yourself to these creators because you're being very objective, right? You're, you're breaking things down in an objective manner between yourself and the creator. But please don't compare yourself to others all the time. Um, make sure that when you do, it's entirely objective in what you're doing because a lot of times people can be caught up in emotions or they can feel bad about being on a different skill level to another individual. There's no need for that. I promise you, you're absolutely fine as you are. And, you know, everyone starts somewhere. Everyone kind of sucks at first. And that's why we're all, you know, choosing to group up and improve together. So back to how to, how to strike gold here. I think the first thing that we need to kind of put down in terms of uh, striking gold is visual quality. And when I initially wrote this Google slide, it was a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare because I couldn't really define exactly what I was talking about at first. And I've chosen the words visual quality because they're the closest that I can get it to. But do be mindful that when I say visual quality, it might not 100% mean that in the in the literal term. It is a little bit of a give and take with that. So, visual quality. What do I mean by this? In the most simplest of terms, in general, and stuff like that, visual quality in this context refers to maintaining a consistent visual on things, right? It's a well-structured image through the use of composition, lighting, and posing. Standard stuff. 
you should consider this as the potential starting point of your of your staff because even if you don't have the best posing or the best composition that kind of actually visual fidelity is a very good term and i gutted that i didn't think of that before i started this presentation um but you should consider this as your potential starting point because even if your composition or lighting isn't the best when you know how to use all three effectively um that is really important because it will elevate the things that aren't quite good into better and better into bestest right as i said here even if your composition and posing isn't great uh, it will uplift your pieces from me mediocre to good and from good to great oh Right, yes, I put down girth, and that was a personal note. I shouldn't have left that in there. But um, Chirax's renders, especially the ones that are more animated, uh, are very girthy in their details and with their camera work. There's a lot of detail in them, and even though there's generally a shallow, shallow focus, there's a lot of stuff going on around the person in general. That's what I mean by girthy camera. <laughs> it's just girthy camera work. Um, yeah, you can absolutely still achieve this kind of stuff with stylized characters. Heck, I'd even consider 2B in this render to be slightly stylized in a, in a, in a way. Um, there's a lot to be said with, like, styles and stuff like that. If you've seen some of my work, for example, I hop between styles quite a bit, between, like, my Overwatch style and my realistic style and so on. And it's absolutely okay to have multiple. So, how do you achieve this kind of stuff? Visual quality is pretty basic in the grand scheme of things. The only fundamental you need to be aware of is to not allow the environment or lights to become so detailed that they take away from the main portions of the render. I'm sure you've seen lighting tutorials before where they're talking about, you know, the light distance matters just as much as the light intensity and so on and so forth. And they're absolutely right with the way that they, uh, they handled those things. The general consensus is, at least for, for me and my experience, is if you can squint or blur the render in such a way that you can still see the silhouette, eyes, nose, and stuff like that, you're on the right track. When the environment becomes too noisy, it t generally takes away from the main piece in such a way that it causes eye strain. And I'm sure you've seen this before, whether you've been scrolling through DeviantArt or Twitter, there's a specific piece that actively hurts your eyes sometimes with how intense it is, especially with like loud colors or anything else like that. You should remind yourself that the main portion of the render is the sole focus. What you're focusing on is the only thing you should be worried about. Um, a good way of maintaining an absolutely busy background, if it's absolutely necessary, is through the use of depth of field and stuff. So say like you have a character on a street corner that's like really busy, you can blot out some of that detail and stuff like that uh, uh, with, with depth of field. The same can be said for lights as well, as apart from some specific circumstances such as daylight, your light should not overbear the piece in terms of its legibility. And you can kind of see this on the right hand side here with my examples. You know, you should aim to add shadows and highlights um, to the to the body and to the shape to complement the character as a whole. And this is especially true for the face, as again, you can see here in the example, because there's a lot of very subtle details in the face that only come out when you have these kinds of highlights and shadows in place. So in general, it's more about simplifying the light to be more effective than it is to add a bunch of lights to light a scene. And I'm absolutely going to be real with you. I'm still guilty of adding too many lights to my scene. I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. A lot of my recent renders have just been one light or no lights at all. So uh, I think I'm getting the hang of it. Color contrast also matters as well. You're absolutely right. Cold color backgrounds and warm tones, stuff like that. Those can also offer a degree of separation. Uh, you know, knowing how to use light effectively with good balance and efficiency, like you see on the right, also improves performance as well. So let's have a look here. What you're seeing is three photos that I picked off the, uh, 
I'll talk about lighting in a second because there is a second slide for it. It's further down the line. But um, what I have here is three images in general that are very, very busy, right? They are at street level or near street level. There's a lot of stuff going on. And as you can see, it's kind of hard to focus on things in general. Um, the, although there's a lot of detail here and it looks fantastic, it's very hard to draw your eye to a very specific thing without the rest of the image kind of drawing in and causing problems. We, we don't know where to look exactly, right? So what I want to show here is a little bit of a contrast. What you see here between these three and these three is these are in the same sort of general area. They're still downtown. They're still very busy and stuff like that. However, they've taken wildly different approaches on how to deal with this busy scene. On the left, you have the buildings as a framing device. They are drawing the eye towards the bridge. And it's almost difficult to look at the vehicles and the signs in this leftmost image because the leading shots are so prevalent towards the bridge that you almost can't really focus on anything else but the bridge. Secondly, the second render, the middle one, is closest to the busy scenes that we've seen prior. They are using a difference in tone, so warm colors, and cold environment. The biggest thing about this, especially, is that the photographer is using um, leading lines or visible lines. And it's basically where the road in this example is coming upwards towards the face, and that's leading the eye into a specific area of the image, specifically her. Lastly, in the last one, is very, very interesting because instead of using depth of field and leading lines and stuff like that, they've instead chosen to keep the background busy. There's a lot of stuff in the third image that is very, very visible. It's very busy in the background. However, they've chosen instead to not like the character at all. The subject is completely silhouetted. And that is super interesting to me because I wouldn't have thought of something like that without seeing that image previously. It pays for references sometimes. It's really good to look at them. So as you can see, these three pieces in similar environments have taken three really big different approaches to uh, making sure that the, the eye doesn't have any strain to it. There's still a leading example of where you should look. So know your lights in general. You can see the main difference between the two renders here. The leftmost render is just two lights, one sun and one area light pointed in the opposite direction. The sun is casting great shadows around the neck, the arms, even bits between her abs under the tank top. Most notably, it's illuminating her hair without it blowing the color out and becoming light brown. You can also see how due to the intensity of the sunlight, her arm and sky are at similar brightness levels, and that makes it a little difficult to look at, especially around like the shoulder and the forearm. That's okay sometimes. That absolutely happens sometimes in daylight renders and stuff like that. And you shouldn't think of that muddy silhouette in around her shoulder and stuff like that as a negative. However, sometimes you may want to correct it with the use of different sun angles, rim lights, and so on. But the main takeaway is the rightmost render, which is the lights are everywhere. There are a lot of lights in this render. Uh, I believe it was four area lights and two rim lights. And as you can see, there is a wildly big difference between the, the Lara on the right and the Lara on the left. The rightmost render, it, if you remember our previous slide talking about the simplification of our scenes, you'll instantly see the problem. While the rims are providing an ample separation between the sky and her silhouette, her hair and some of the features on her body are in a weird, like, sort of lit, sort of not kind of stage where things are, they should be a shadow, but they're not because there's also lights in, in different sections, so on and so on. Some things to watch out for in general is inconsistent tone. Uh, Sorry, even intensity, which is no lights and no shadows. You can see that in the rightmost render where 
there is one or two clear shadows, but for otherwise, the, the shadow on her face is still very evenly lit. Her forearm looks a little bit weird because it's not quite lit properly in a, in a, in a realistic manner. And because of that, because there's no proper shadows or highlights, the even intensity is throwing things off. There is inconsistent tone, which is... It's hard to describe, but imagine if you had a very sad render or a very moody render. Inconsistent tone refers to lights that are considered happy or bright uh, in those moody scenes or sad scenes. So if you have lights that are very bright, you should also consider the fact that the lights also carry emotion sometimes, such as bisexual lighting and stuff like that. These things uh, will convey different emotions, so just make sure... Um, just make sure, in general, that the, the tone between your light placement, your tone of your lights, the emotion of your lights, also fits the scene in a, in a, in a general sense. Yeah, so depending on what the goal or the scene is, there isn't a right or wrong answer to this. They all have their uses in general. I did remove a paragraph from this slide. And it talked about how everything had its uses. I had to cut it because it didn't really sound right in, in, in the context. But in general, yes, left and right are absolutely fine in a, in, a, in a general term, in a general sense. Sometimes, typically speaking, the rightmost render is used in things like interior scenes, in, you know, in corridors, in buildings, that kind of stuff. And the leftmost render is out in broad daylight. What I'm trying to reference is... There's a time and a place for both. Although you should be simplifying your lights most of the time, there is still a situation where you do want to double up on your light count or even uh, change how your lights are positioned in such a way that they convey a different emotions. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. I'll stop and let you guys ask any questions. Uh, the rightmost one has the most lights. So that one had, I believe it was four area lights and two rim lights. Uh, the leftmost render is just an area light and a sunlight. How would you do very stylized lighting with just one light though? Um, it's not necessary that you have to use one light or very minimal lights every single time. With a cyberpunk type lighting, you have a lot of blues, a lot of greens, a lot of turquoise, and then you have complementary colors such as purples, oranges, that kind of stuff. Well, I could, I could, you, I, I could answer a couple more questions here, but I think there is a couple slides in, down the line that do make a lot more sense. So I'm going to move on, and you'll have your questions answered there a little bit more. And we can always dump extra questions on at the end because I don't mind answering them for the next hour or so afterwards. So moving on, um, map geometry. This is a big one, and I think some people forget about it sometimes. Map geo can and will affect how your lights change the subject. Sometimes for the better, like uh, let's say you have a window next to your character and that's casting an interesting gobo onto the, onto the subject, but sometimes for the worse as well, where you have a sunlight that's being blocked out by a specific piece of map geometry. And it's absolutely okay to tear apart different parts of the map so that you can get the lighting style that you want, as long as it doesn't compromise the map itself in terms of its legibility. The map still has to make sense in the background of your camera. Everywhere else, doesn't matter. If it's not in the camera, doesn't matter. So, depth of field. This is an interesting one, too. Um, depth of field, like I said previously, can and will help busy scenes like street corners and stuff like that to be separated from your subject. But it also has to be dependent on scale. So, if this Lara, for example, was 12 feet tall and I turned on the depth of field, it would see her as 12 feet tall instead of five or so feet that she actually needs to be. And this fucks with perspective in the setting sometimes, because if she's 12 feet tall, she's technically the size of a building or even a small skyscraper sometimes, depending on how the scaling is in, in your Blender scenes. So just make sure that things are actually to scale, things are modeled to scale, and your depth of field will help you greatly with separating these things from the background. 
Lastly, I want to touch on this just very, very briefly, because I've seen a couple of people talk about it here and there, but uh, model quality sometimes plays a factor into lighting your subject. There are highly circumstantial situations where someone has built a model and let's say the hair doesn't have the roughness maps that it needs to, that kind of stuff. Um, it's very hard to light someone's hair when they don't have roughness maps for those hair because you're not going to get the shine that you see in the leftmost render on Lara's hair, for example. So there's a bit of a, a touch and go with which model you use sometimes. And indeed, a lot of people will switch between different models of the same character in order to achieve different things. Or if you're like myself, uh, it's just about making sure that you could even potentially freely edit these things and making sure that you can fix some of the technical issues so that you achieve a better render as well. <laughs> fix it in post, gang. Absolutely, I do, I do do that. I do fix a lot of things in post sometimes. Mm. There's a, as you get further into this kind of stuff and you get more technically literate, you will start to edit the models that you're using on the fly as you're creating renders. And typically you'll save separate files of those models with your fixes included. And that's kind of how you develop and that's how people make like improvements on, on existing models and stuff like that. Indeed, I've done that with a couple of Tracer and Mercy models as well. So, I think we're all good. Don't think we have any more questions or anything like that. So let's uh, let's let's move on. Let's push on. So, in general, the main thing is is to train your creative eye when you're cr when you're making pieces. It's all well and good to light the scene effectively, but if the composition and the way that you're creating renders is wrong, it's not going to fit right. Number one, it's reminding yourself. So it's very hard as an artist to work on several things at once, whether that's pieces of content or uh, different projects or even, you know, clear goals and stuff like that. It's important that you have a clear goal in mind when it comes to improving with a specific render, whether you set out one day to go, I'm going to make a render with better depth of field or I'm going to make a render with multi-res sculpting, so on and so forth. Um, but just remind yourself why you're making that render. It doesn't always have to be a goal when you're producing a render, but um, sometimes it's helpful to have a goal in mind when you do produce something. It's important to remember though that you don't sacrifice other bits within that render for the sake of improving something else. The idea is, is that you slowly drag in this extra experience on top of what you're working on regularly so that it becomes part of your workflow in the future. Pause, perceive, perform is just as it says. It's very easy to get ahead of yourself when you're producing renders. And what I recommend for people who are first choosing to improve their stuff is to pause every once in a while. Go into the render view, have a look for yourself, you know, is, you know, whether it's finalized or not, you can take a look and you can be like, okay, do I need to do anything? Do I need to tweak any kind of settings? Is the light placement okay? Is the rim lights working good? Is the composition working out? So on and so forth. A little bit of reflection while you're working on the render. And that also ties into perceive. Performance is just knowing and evaluating what you have to change in the moment and then actually executing that. And what I recommend is you only act on these things once you have a very clear written set of goals that you've took from pausing and looking at that render. So let's say you're halfway through making a piece of art, you stop, you have a look at it, you jot a couple things down, you know, composition could be better, lighting could be better, so on and so forth. Once that list is complete, or you feel that it is complete, then you move on and you start making those changes. Critique in general is very important as well. Um, I know a lot of people here are kind of scared to critique or even scared to receive critique, but I'd argue that it is too important to pass up sometimes. 
we're a very very big community here in in the uh, in the NSFW Blender Discord, and it's important for us to sometimes stop and talk to each other about what we're doing and what we're working on because if someone fails at something else, they can tell other people and other people can avoid that pitfall in the future. So we're all kind of improving together as we talk about our failures and stuff like that. While working on a piece, you should take it to your friends, to other people, and you should ask them for ways to improve it while you have the time to do so. Critique is an important part of being an artist. You shouldn't feel depressed or sad when you get to critique. Instead, you should be using that information to further improve your artwork for the next time. Grouping up and showing each other your artwork will share knowledge across multiple people. In the simplest of terms, if somebody fucks up and tells you uh, and tells everyone else about it, multiple people will be aware of the mistakes and correct it in their own artwork, like I said before. Yes, the Google slide will be available. The Google slides will be available at the end of the workshop. I'll make sure they're uploaded permanently. Also, a little bit of a public service announcement as well. Um, in this Discord especially, um, there is no hostility in critique whatsoever. You know, if you're being hostile to someone while giving them critique, it's not critique. Um, constructive criticism is formed by giving the person compliments for what they've done right and giving them pointers as to where they've gone wrong. You know, you shouldn't poke fun at people for the work that they do and the output that they have. We're all at different skill levels and we're all kind of, you know, improving at different levels. The point of all this, and up until this point, everything that I've been talking about is I'm trying to get you to have the this ability to, you know, the point of all this is talking about when it comes to starting off a render, you know, I know everyone here has experienced this at some point. You know, you either start here on the on the on the Venn diagram, you either start here or here. And that's perfectly fine. Even I, someone, you know, that posts weekly now, I'll have times where I start a a project and it'll be mostly posing. Or mostly lighting and composition and the posing is kind of dog shit. That's okay. That's absolutely fine. You shouldn't feel bad about starting in these different positions. The information that I'm giving you today and the information that I've been talking about up until this point is to give you the ability to recognize, okay, I'm in this sort of section of the Venn diagram right now. And over time, as I'm working on the piece, I can push it towards the center. You should always be aiming for that kind of trifecta, that harmonization of lighting, composition, and posing, where eventually as time goes on and as you're working on that project, you are drawing your starting point closer and closer or as close as you can to the center. So let's move on. This is my favorite part of the piece. Um, this is the creative might. And I know you guys will really like this because it talks about a lot of very interesting concepts that don't really get talked about too often. I'm going to also stop here to take a drink because I haven't had one. <laughs> So what is the creative might? And the simplest way that I can describe it is it's your motivation. It's that drive. I know all of you at some point who've made content, there's a time where you get up and you're like, I really want to do something. I want to absolutely tear my claws into this project that I'm working on and produce the best work that I can do. And if not, well, I have a couple of tips here to show you how to feel like that and how to feel confident in the work that you do. Finding your creative limit. Every so often, we'll host something like a challenge in the Discord server. I'm sure you've seen them before or in a round. You are asked to create something in a specific manner, whether it's an animation, a still image, something from a reference and so on. While people may overlook these things because you're nervous or something like that, 
they are very good utilities that allow you to express and find your creative limit why like where you're at with content making and what i mean by your creative limit is your absolute maximum what is your ability at its absolute best and when you're being tested the most these challenges that are in discord they will throw you off the comfortable roads that you've been making for yourself up until this point and they'll put you on a dirt track somewhere and see how you navigate home and the point of that is to jump outside the box, get out of your comfort zone and do something that you wouldn't have normally done because it's good practice. It's, it's very, very important that you do this. Testing yourself like this is a fantastic way of finding your limit. The benefit of running this within a discord is that you have other people that are also doing the same challenge. You know, when people, when these challenges go live, there's like 30, 40 people doing the same thing. Don't stay silent. Talk to these people because I guarantee they're going through the same trials and tribulations that you are. If you want to find your limit because you know that kind of, if you do want to find your limit, you have to find that kind of skill ceiling you have. And when you do find that skill ceiling, you can more accurately predict what you can and can't make within a time frame. So, you know, if you know your absolute limit, you know that you can only make, say, a render with three characters in three hours. That is your limit. You know how long something's going to take, or at least an idea of something is going to take. And knowing that clear dividing line between what you can and can't do will also let you set realistic goals that push that boundary upwards. So lifting your skill ceiling even more. It's important to jump outside the box, crash through the glass ceiling and try new things. By doing so, you're preventing yourself from becoming stagnant where the content that you produce and the quality of that content stays forever. So you're never improving, you know, you're getting a little bit stale, you're doing the same things over and over again. It's good sometimes to get out and put your claws and your teeth into something completely different because I guarantee you'll come back with lessons even if you fail. It's okay to fail sometimes when you do these things, because that's how we learn. As I say here, who knows, you might even find something that you really do enjoy that you otherwise wouldn't have tried. You know, if it wasn't for someone like Sticky Buns making me aware of multi-res sculpting, I probably wouldn't be doing it right now. And I really love multi-res sculpting because it's fucking awesome. It can feed your niche, it can feed your new learning of a skill and stuff like that. It can even fall into things like your motivation and your time trials. That intensity, that ability to jump into the frying pan in a healthy manner really does help you in the long run for exploring different opportunities that you have. A lot of people, when they want to improve, will skip ahead sometimes or force themselves into a situation where they don't want to improve, where they don't improve as well as they should. It's important to remember that you can only take baby steps, steps sometimes when it comes to improving yourself with a specific aspect, whether that's lighting, composition, posing, so on and so forth. There is a very big difference between pushing yourself in a healthy manner and tossing yourself into the frying pan and hoping for the best. While there are certain situations where tossing yourself into the frying pan is absolutely fine, um, you shouldn't do it every day, right? You need to be aware of when it's healthy or not. Because I guarantee you, if you throw yourself into the fire, into the frying pan, without a plan, without this healthy mindset, you're going to hurt yourself mentally and physically. To prevent this, it's important that you have a clear goal in mind when you want to set out and improve something. Whether it's challenging yourself, recreating something that you've seen from a reference or from a picture, or just trying to push the amount of content that you can produce on a consistent basis, like we're talking about today. These are all very valid ways of pushing the artist within you forward. At the end of the day, you should be feeling good about yourself when you complete these tasks. That is the most important aspect, and it is the one that will tell you as to whether or not you are shoving or pushing yourself. If you aren't enjoying what challenges you put yourself into, then they are not healthy challenges you're setting for yourself. Limitations. 
sometimes, and this is a lot of you, absolutely a lot of you, and it's okay to feel this way sometimes, right? I've seen it everywhere. Sometimes people will say that they don't have the hardware. You know, I don't know, I don't have the know-how, I don't have the technical skill to do X, Y, Z. You know, I, I can't make renders like X, Y, Z. I can't make renders like rigid or, or baits or something like that. And, and in some instances, that is true. You know, maybe your physical skill isn't quite there yet. Or maybe your hardware isn't capable of rendering in cycles like other people can. So what can you do? What can you do when you have these limitations? And the answer is do what you can. You shouldn't see your hardware limitations or skill limitations as anything but training weights. They are not shackles that tether you down, but they are very, very helpful tools that will help you in the future. Those with good hardware have the ability to fuck up sometimes and make unoptimized or even lazy renders with the way that they set up computationally expensive stuff. So things like sculpting, multi-res, volumes, particles, all that kind of stuff. You don't have that luxury. When you don't have the hardware prowess that other people do, you don't have that luxury to fuck up. And so you have to be efficient with the way that you handle things like multi-res sculpting. So why, why is that important? Why is that good that you can't do these things yet? Why is having bad hardware a skill rather than a hindrance? And it's because once those training weights are lifted and you cut yourself off and you do improve your GPU, you'll have this efficiency in your head from the start. You know what I mean? So, you know, let's say you're working with like a 980 or a 1080 or even like the the 1050 laptop GPU that someone has said, that's absolutely fine. And as long as you do what you can, do what you can, you stay efficient and you work within those boundaries, when you eventually do get better hardware and you have those really powerful rigs and PCs, that's when you can double back and go, okay, I'm still very efficient, you know? I'm not going to dismiss what I learned when I had my 1050 or 1060. I'm still going to apply those things because that's just how I learn things. And so you're always going to be a little bit more experienced with efficiency than other people who started with better hardware. Sometimes you don't want to do an idea because you feel as if you don't have the quality that you would like in order to make it, you know? You know, I can't make this until I'm at like 5,000 followers and I have really good renders, stuff like that, right? While I respect that you may want to hold off a couple of ideas for the future, which is absolutely okay, I think that waiting on certain concepts because you believe that you can't do them yet is a little bit of a farce. You can do them. It's okay to do them now. You can always go back and redo that piece of content in the future when you have more technical skill and more, more powerful hardware. Don't limit yourself with the idea of I can't do this until X or I can't achieve Y until ABC because I guarantee you it'll only end up with you doing nothing in the long term. Long and short term, I should say. This is the cool bit now, and I think you guys will really like this, because when I introduce this concept to other people, they kind of go wide-eyed and go, oh my god, I can improve in a really cool way. Um, deadlines hold you to the mark. Uh, having a schedule that you stick to religiously will force you to become more creative as you run in and out of ideas. Over time, as you get used to this deadline system, you begin getting into a groove to allow you to start producing content almost like a machine. And indeed, there was a situation where, you know, a couple months back where I made three really nice renders in one week because I was in such a machine mode that I was producing stuff very, very well in such a, an efficient amount of time. Same could be said for time trials. It takes a lot of pressure to turn coal into diamonds, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Time trials attempt to do the same thing, but with your efficiency and with quality. Let's say it takes you three hours to complete a piece that you're happy with. Could you do the same amount of quality in only half the time? What are the obstacles that you're running into which extends the amount of time that it takes to produce a render in general? 
If you're not already, I highly recommend that you go and download the add-on for Blender that allows you to time yourself on a project. Uh, I think it's available somewhere. There might be a link, Orochi, if you want to like send a link or something like that uh, in a minute. But um, that project timer is fantastic because you get to see how long it's taking you to produce something that you're happy with. However, you should only look at that timer once you are absolutely finished. Don't use it as something to hold yourself to whenever you're working on a piece. You should only look at it afterwards because when you, you know, when you look at it when you're working, the pressure can mount up and you can become sloppy and you can make common mistakes, so on and so forth. So only look at it once you've absolutely finished. By challenging yourself in this way, you are changing the amount of time it takes to create and finish a render that you're happy with, and it will shorten down almost like a condensed format. So you're taking this big, long process that you've been doing, and you're shortening it. You're squeezing the ends together, and you are trimming the fat out of the stuff that isn't needed. You're learning how to use the software in a much more efficient manner. You can navigate things a lot quicker, so on and so forth. Make sure when you're doing this as well, and it's a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a big, big red stop sign sometimes, that the deadlines and time trials are realistic when you do them. Don't set out to create a six-hour render in an hour because it's not going to happen, right? Don't set out to create something that's absolutely amazing when you can't produce something and post it consistently. You see what I mean? The the, the goals much like previously with your, your improvement goals, your deadlines and your time trials need to be realistic as such as well. Making the deadlines and time trials so severe will cause you to be stressed and you don't, you end up not wanting to produce content because of it. And I guarantee you that as long as you maintain a realistic schedule and a realistic idea of what these time trials and deadlines should be, you'll be okay, I promise you, because as long as you have that healthy state in mind and you are very, very careful with how you do things and you talk to people and you communicate these things, you'll all be good. You shouldn't feel bad for failing one of these, by the way. Um, even me, myself, someone right now, um, I failed a number of time trials and deadlines. Indeed, there's a period of time a couple of weeks ago where I didn't post weekly for about two or three weeks. And it was because I was having a really hard time putting work together because I was stressed. It's okay to not do stuff sometimes. It's okay to have a bit of lull in your activity. And you shouldn't feel bad when you, when you fail a time trial or fail a deadline that you set out for yourself. All you have to do is pick it apart. You know, why did this fail? How did it fail? Is there anything that I can do in the future to prevent it from failing again? So on and so forth. The extra 10%. So, I talked about multi-res sculpting before. Uh, that's one of these things. I'm sure that everyone, every one of us at some point has finished a render and wondered what we could do to improve it further. The extra 10% is the small details, the things that don't typically go notice to a consumer, but add up very, very quickly as a collective. This can be as simple as making sure that the clothes fit the person that you're rendering, and it can be as complex as multi-res sculpting, squishies, skin indentations, that sort of thing. Very simple renders can become masterpieces, especially with someone like Bates's work. Those things are masterpieces even when they're typically pretty simple. And the reason why is because there's all of these little details. It's the skin indentations. It's the, you know, it's the squishies, you know, stuff is being pushed together, there's physics, so on and so forth. Have a think about what kind of work you do as a creator. I know a lot of you are animators, some of you are still image artists, so on and so forth. You know, whether you're mostly pinup focused or do animations or anything else like that, have a think about, you know, is there anything that you feel you could be elevating by doing these things? Almost always the answer is yes in terms of tweaking things to be better. 
Um, but a lot of these things can be difficult without support. Obviously, not all of us have high-end hardware to do multi-res sculpting and stuff like that, so that's more of a pipe dream. Uh, but to those people who feel a little bit let down that they may not be capable of doing things like uh, multi-res sculpting just yet, there are other avenues that you can pursue. For example, you know, is the hair in a certain way? If they're doing an action that's causing their hair to move, you should pose the hair. If they have earrings that move, you should pose the earrings, so on and so forth. It doesn't always just have to be the sculpting and the technologically impressive stuff. Sometimes it boils down to like all the fingers and posed and the collar is moved and stuff like that. And it's those small things that still add up. Those are still, still all absolutely fine. Sometimes it's, you know, the body is a very complex thing. I'm sure we're all aware of this by now with how complex some rigs are. The human body is fucking crazy, right? Um, the way it transmits weights, the way it handles our body language and stuff like that, it's very difficult to nail these things right first time. And you shouldn't be dissuaded when they don't turn out first time. A lot of the times when I'm producing content and stuff like that, I'll double back, I'll reset, and I'll try and do the body language stuff again. So on and so forth. So... It's all well and good, you know, me talking to you about the extra 10%, but what about an example? An example of 10%. Well, take my render from last week. When I finished this render, it initially, it took about an hour and 30 minutes plus post, right? So that is start to finish from Blender, from opening up Blender to Photoshop, it took me an hour and 30 minutes. And you can see how when I went back and doubled over, the extra 30 or so minutes or the extra 50 or so minutes that I put into this render saved it. I actually think that it wouldn't have been as good of a render if I had posted the leftmost rather than the rightmost. And it's it's those small things, you know, it's the it's the sunburn on her chest, it's the freckles, it's the the subtle details in her eyes and stuff like that that I changed. There's not a lot of difference between these two renders, you know what I mean? Is Photoshop really that necessary? I'll be talking about that in a minute. I've got a really funny slide for you for that. I, I do a lot of work in post myself. Uh, I think I spend anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour in post. Yeah, and as, as Gotto pointed out here, the, the difference between uh, the breasts is very different because in one of them they are floating and the other ones they are not. And it was that small change that, that actually spurred me to continue working on it because I wasn't happy with the leftmost render and this stuff. So, over the past couple slides and stuff like that, um, I've been talking about reflection. And some of you may not be aware of what reflection is in, 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 a, in, a, in an art sense. Sometimes you finish a piece and things just feel off. Nothing is necessarily wrong with the render or even you, but you have this air of uneasiness or contemplation. This is the perfect time for you to sit down and think about the render that you just made. If you're wondering what questions to ask yourself in this time, you can use the questions that I've provided on the right. It's important that we sometimes sit down and think about the renders that we make because we can more clearly identify what went wrong within that render and what went right within that render and how to replicate the things that went right in our future content. Depending on how you feel, you may not want to, you may not want to post that render immediately and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I will finish a piece myself and I won't post it because I feel either it's not good enough or it may need extra tweaking, like in the case of the, the Tracer render. If this is the case, typically I will leave the render for a, a little while and I'll come back to it. I'll go distract myself with something else. It's very easy to get caught up in the emotions of a piece when you've just finished it. And so sometimes it's preferable to walk away and come back. 
this may not be you know applicable to all of you but for myself um as someone who comes up with renders and ideas in my head a lot and then put them down on paper um sometimes i finish a piece and it doesn't match what what my head was thinking at the time and that can throw me for a loop sometimes um this isn't necessarily bad it's just a quirk of how i come up with ideas and how i produce content and i'm sure there'll be one or two of you that that feel the same way there is a degree of difficulty when it comes to you know putting content on the page you know in blender from your head from reference so on and so forth So, inspiration and motivation. Inspiration and motivation are two separate things. A lot of people mix them up sometimes. Motivation is the drive to create something, whereas the inter inspiration is more of the ideas of, uh, of what you're doing. You can find a lot of inspiration in things like movies, games, TV shows, and stuff like that. I'm sure that, you know, you've played a video game at some point and something very funny has happened and you've gone, oh, that'd be really funny as a render and so on and so forth. However, if you finding motivation is a lot harder, you know, I guarantee a lot of you have lost motivation to work on something before and it can be a little bit daunting to jump back into it once you've lost motivation because you feel all is lost. You shouldn't put your motivation in things such as followers, retweets, or anything of that sort, that's very fragile to do. Instead, you should bring motivation from the stuff that you do day to day. So, you know, I want to produce stuff that's different from everyone else, or I just want to see myself improve, or just have fun. Those are all very valid reasons to have motivation to do what you do. And, you know, even if you ask each other in, in the chat, or even ask some of your friends who also do this kind of stuff, I'm guaranteed you will get an absolute litany of different answers from people. For myself, my motivation is I just want to be a better artist in general. And for me, being a better artist means trying a whole host of different styles and people and renders and different types of renders and combining that stuff. This is sort of related to burnout, uh, which is on the next slide. However, there'll be t sometimes where you wake up and you don't feel like doing anything. That's absolutely fine as well. Um, it can mean you're experiencing a little bit of a lull in your inspiration and motivation. And my solution is to just go and do something else, right? It's okay to not do something for a little bit, you know? And I'll talk about that in a minute because it's a big slide. But... Um, Go browse Twitter, go see what other people are making, check up on a couple friends, see what they're working on and stuff like that. Because I guarantee the more that you interact with other people, the more that you express the fact that you're kind of in this lull at the moment, um, you will eventually find your way back home and you'll start producing content again. Forcing yourself to work isn't going to do anything good for you because it's only going to make you more stressed and it's only going to make you feel more doubtful about your own skills. We often feel guilty when we're not at our computers and not working because we're at our computer. We should be working right now, you know? I've got a Patreon or a Twitter to fill with content. I should be working every day of the week. You don't have to do that, you know what I mean? We're not separated from our work like a typical nine to five is. And, you know, with a typical nine to five, you leave your problems at the door and you come home and you're in a different head, in a different headspace. We don't have that luxury when we do this stuff in, in our free time. Just remind yourself that you do need breaks. There is no need for crunch or anything else like that or unhealthy habits. Pace yourself, okay? Be kind to yourself. Make sure that whenever you are pursuing these types of things, you are doing it in a healthy manner like I was talking about. Yeah, hydrate, you know? Hydrate. Go eat something for myself and me personally. I have an alarm at 11.30 in the morning and I have an alarm at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I consider those my breaks. It's basically, you know, because I have ADHD and I have a little bit of autism as well. Sometimes I find it hard to break away from the computer and I can get wrapped up in a lot of projects. 
when that alarm goes off for 11.30 or 3 o'clock, I'm reminded, okay, I need to take a break. You know, I need to go eat something. I need to go watch something, do something different, because otherwise I'm just going to run myself into the ground. Burnout. Now, I love you guys to death. I really do. I think you're some of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. You guys are fantastic creators, big and small. I'm not lying. I'm serious with that, right? You guys are very, very interesting to, to someone that hasn't been in the NSFW space for all that long. Over the last couple months, I'm sure you've seen a lot of artists quit or leave the Discord slash Twitter space because they've had enough. You know, they don't feel the same sparks that they used to. And I'm sure some of you have felt like that before. This is burnout. This is absolutely burnout. It occurs when you've been focusing on one kind of content for too long and your brain needs a little bit of a reset, so it's forcing you to reset. For many of you, this is the first time that you've done something creative. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people in here that they haven't done any drawing before, they haven't pursued 3D before, and they're just getting into it now with the NSFW stuff. And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have the... You don't really... You haven't really encountered the, the pitfalls and the mountains that could happen when you're an artist because you're just starting out. I can safely say with confidence, absolutely, that you're not the only person to experience these kinds of feelings. Okay, you're not alone in this. It's absolutely okay to message people sometimes and ask how they're doing. Even if they're burnt out, you know, it, it's important to speak to people. Over the past decade of me doing work, whether it be 2D, 3D graphics, so on and so forth, I felt like I want to quit more times than I care to count. Especially at the start of this year, when I was extremely stressed, I was dealing with applying to university and so on and so forth. There was a lot of things that were really compounding on my ability to make art and I was getting super stressed about the idea of producing content and I felt like I wanted to quit for a little bit because I didn't have that spark anymore but I guarantee you it will come back absolutely it'll come back your brain just needs a break burnout can happen for many reasons um the most frequent is feeling like your art isn't progressing uh typically I'm sure a lot of people before you know They've made three or four renders in, in a sequence or something like that. And you go, well, the, the most recent one isn't as good as the most, like, earliest one. Like, what's going on or something like that. You know, people make the mistake that art and the progress within art is a linear path upwards. When in reality, it's more like a squiggly line. You're always improving and decreasing and improving again, so on and so forth. It's never just a straightforward path. Some days you'll be better. Some days you'll be worse. Some days you'll just be in between. And that's, again, absolutely fine. You should never feel bad that the art you made today is a little bit worse than yesterday because that's how we roll as an artist sometimes. And I, I'm, I will fully admit, you know, there was a post that I made on Wednesday uh, it didn't do as well, and it hurt me a little bit, you know? Like, I didn't get the, the same amount of love that I typically get when I post a, a piece of work. And that that hit me in the chest a little bit, you know? And burnout can result from that as well. The only way you can fix the difference, the only way you can stop burnout and pursue this kind of medium again is be here tomorrow. I guarantee you these feelings are only temporary, but you have to be here tomorrow. Over time, with consistency and with motivation, you will close the gap between your best and your worst art. And you shouldn't feel dissuade when you feel this way. Recognize what it is, which is burnout, and recognize that it is your brain telling you that you need to reflect, take a break, do something else. Don't push yourself because I guarantee you it'll only end in disaster. While there are people that have already left the community and we may never see them again, it is my hope that they do return and that we can tell them about our experiences, right? You know what I mean? 
and I almost just knocked over a can. I don't know whether you guys heard that or not, but that was absolutely funny. So, on to the technical side of things. Now, a lot of what we've been talking about today has been physical, mental, that kind of stuff. Uh, but now everything in from now on is going to be technical. Actual things that will help your renders achieve gold. And I know a lot of you uh, join this chat specifically for this. So let's kind of crack on, shall we? We'll, we'll, we'll show you how to make some gold. Let's start with lights, camera, and action. Three big things, much like composition and stuff like that. Lights. I know you guys had a lot of questions about lights and stuff like that, so I'll ask them in this section. I'll give you a little bit of a time to like write out your questions and stuff like that. So, lights and add-ons and three-point lighting. As an artist, light is one of the most important things you work with. Your camera and your composition are a close second, but bad lighting can and will make or break a piece, even if it's some of the best and most detailed work. You can think of light as the audio to the video. I'm sure you've seen videos where people are saying that although your camera may not be the best, your audio should be fantastic. This is the same case for lights as well. There are add-ons out there that will allow you to easily generate like one-click three-point lighting setups, and these are handy, but don't rely upon them for anything more than guidance. I know it's a little bit painful at first, but learning how to light your scenes manually without add-ons will help you in the long run. When you have that freedom and understanding of why three-point lights and even two-point lights and one-point lights work, and you, you have that knowledge, creating scenes where they need more or less lights is super important. You'll, you'll get there a lot quicker. Not all scenes require three-point lighting. Um, I know that you guys were having a discussion a little bit before. The you know, does every scene need three-point lighting? No, absolutely not. I've gotten around a lot of things just by adding in a single sun lamp, and that's it. In fact, the tracer render that I showed you is one sun lamp. I didn't even add another light. It's just one light. When you know how to light a scene manually, you'll be able to sit down and go, okay, I don't need a fill. I don't need a backlight. I don't need a key light or anything else like that. I just need one or two. I know where to position them roughly, and I can tweak that as I'm working. Having that knowledge and not relying upon add-ons is great because you won't always have that add-on with you. Sometimes you'll have to do it manually, and having that knowledge is important. There is a lot to talk about with light, and I did cut a couple things here and there. Um, if you're interested on how to light the stuff that you're making better, um, I recommend delving into the photography side of things on the internet. Go look at a form, go search some ways on how to do photography and stuff like that, because they do apply to Blender. Blender's camera is functionally a camera, just like any other in, uh, in a scene. Um, there are a number of ways to go about this, but I recommend searching three specific things. That is gobos or light gobos. Uh, they are basically texturing a light with a certain uh, color or a certain uh, black and white texture to have more interesting uh, light leakage. Uh, Kiss X, the examples that I added onto uh, this Google slide, use those gobos because they're really good at like making like light shining through blinds and stuff like that. Uh, black body intensity, that's really good. Black body intensity is just the Kelvin amount for a light. Uh, if any of you have been in film production or photography or anything else like that, I'm sure you've heard the term like 72 Kelvin or 5600 Kelvin being thrown around a little bit. And that refers to the warmness or the coolness of light. Generally speaking, daylight is, I think, 7200 Kelvin. Uh, and moonlight is nine, I think, is it 9,000? I think it's 7,800 Kelvin or something close to that. But as you can see, black body intensity will help you with things like sun lamps or making realistic lights that aren't LEDs, so on and so forth. Uh, I used a lot of black body lights in my Pan Am render, uh, the one where she's in a vehicle. 
and they turned out really well, super nice and clean. Lastly, this Rembrandt lighting. There was someone in here before talking about, you know, how do you light a scene with one light? Um, Rembrandt lighting is the answer, and that's typically that you are placing a light on a 45 degree angle to the face about five meters away, and that's considered a Rembrandt light. And the reason why it's called Rembrandt light is because he painted most of his uh, subjects with that style of light. There's a whole bunch of like information about it and stuff like that, and I guarantee you'll be interested in learning more about it because it will help your renders. So, uh, five feet from the subject. So uh, wherever their face is, it's five, uh, sorry, five meters from them. Or is it five feet? I forget what the thing is. You're going to have to look it up because I'm a dum-dum and I didn't write it down. It's either five feet or five meters, and that's a big difference. So, light and clarity. Lights are a finicky thing in Blender. Depending on the intensity or the position of the lights, you can gain vast, vastly different visual states. For cycles especially, the environment will be reflecting and bouncing onto your subject with the lights that you put in the scene. Depending on the intensity and the saturation of that light, it can cause different effects and potentially problems. So what I mean by this is, um, consider the images that I'm about to show you. Um, for example, these two right here. Now this render is identical. These are the exact same render. The only difference is, is that I've changed the saturation on the rightmost one. On the left-hand side, I've set the light to be 100% red. It's absolutely saturated. And because of that, the light that is bouncing off of this panel that I placed in the scene is also 100% red. It's the equivalent of being in a dark room, if you know what like dark rooms are in like photography. When you reduce the amount of saturation in a light, there is more white light introduced, I think. Uh, I think that's how it is technically in Blender. And so when when that light bounces onto a subject and then bounces back, you get more color. You get a different bounce effect because that light is then transmitting some of the color on that object onto your subject. And you can see just how much of a difference that makes. And indeed, as I put down here, when lights are too intense or they're too saturated, you lose a lot of the details. If you look at this tracer render that's 100% red, it's kind of difficult to look at. If you remember what I was talking about with like busy scenes, you can't really get a bead on her in any way. You know, her face is kind of obscured. Her nose is kind of pointy and weird, so on and so forth. If you need a bright scene and you don't want to blow out all the detail within it, you should be playing with the exposure and gamma settings in the color management tab because that will allow you to increase the amount of light in a render without actually increasing the light. You just increase the exposure stops and it'll, it'll, it'll fix it most of the time anyway. With the, satur with the saturation tweaking, um, you gain a lot more interesting stuff. You know, uh, as you can see here, the light coming from the panel with it being blue has given this a totally different feel, you know? There's still that kind of air of like what's going on, a little bit of uncertainty, so on and so forth. But um, you have this big, big difference. This is only one light. You know, need I remind you, it's just one light. And this, it feels like there's two lights in the scene. So always be mindful of how you're building your lights in your environment, because I guarantee you, Somewhere, sometimes, there'll be a way of bouncing light onto your subject that is really cool and really special. Does anyone have any questions about lights before I move on? Because I know there's a couple. Hopefully I've answered the majority of them already. <laughs> You make two colors with one light. Um, you make two colors with one light because there isn't two lights in the scene. There's just one. The the blue that you're seeing in this render is from the panel that I've placed here. 
So the light is bouncing onto this plane that I've put and it's bounced back onto Tracer. I should mention too, that's only for cycles. You're not going to get that with EV unless I think you do one of those baking things, but I haven't tested that. So it, your mileage may vary on that side. Is flat lighting always bad? No, not, not, in, not in any circumstance. I would consider my tracer render to be slightly flat with, with its uh, lighting because it's just one light, you know? Um, if it's anime or cell shaded, you don't have to worry too much about it because the cell shading will do most of the detail work for you in the general sense. You still have to do like tweaking and stuff. Uh, Blender's default light bounces is 1024 sample. Should we change it? No, um, only if you know what you're doing with it. Never change it only if you know what you're doing with it because changing it to 2048 or even 4096 will increase your render times exponentially because it's doing more bounces. In terms of what uh, back square, so the, the light is hitting this plane and it's bouncing back. So anywhere behind this plane is completely dark. It's not passing through the plane, it's hitting the plane and bouncing back. And that's why you get the bounce light. You can use Eevee for realistic renders. Absolutely, you can use Eevee for realistic renders. The only thing you have to do is it takes more tweaking and time. You have to bake, you have to sit and wait, you have to position lights in a more interesting way to make it better. You can think of Eevee as your typical game engine light, because that's what it is. It's just game engine style lighting that you're manipulating. Cycles is ray tracing. So it's one of those two. Are we all good? Hopefully we're all good. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> okay, camera. Camera is an interesting one. If you guys haven't already seen, um, Blender had an update. I think it was in 3.4, 3.5, where they added the ability to see the compositor in the viewport shading tab. As long as you're in rendered view, that is. The compositor is awesome, right? I recommend looking up tutorials on it, on YouTube and stuff like that. It can do everything from save you rendering time to applying bloom to your cycles renders. I know there's a good couple of questions about add, like adding bloom to your cycles sometimes. Um, being able to preview these changes in the compositor and in the viewport at the same time, it is so helpful because it means that people like me, you know, who adds barrel distortion and stuff like that, which I'll get into in a second. When I add those things into the, into the scene, I've always had to re-render them or had to wait until it composes first. But now it's all in real time in, in the actual viewport, as long as you have it selected. So quick tips. The people that like realism, listen up, because these things are awesome. They, they change so much about a render. Um, firstly is chromatic aberration. Combined with lens distortion and uh, so Chromatic aberration and lens distortion are part of the same shader in the compositor. Um, they should be used lightly. Typically a 0.01 or 0.015 works best. Um, chromatic aberration occurs when there's kind of like separation at the edges of the lens and that causes the, uh, the, the ends of the lens to fringe and separate the color into different things. You can kind of see it in the preview there. I don't know too much about it, all I know is that it's technically considered like a camera imperfection, but we, we want that imperfection because that's what gives us a little bit of realism. But like I said, you want it in moderation, very small amounts. The only thing to note is that you should be very careful because obviously if you have a face in the corner of your screen or if you have something important in the corner of your screen, it's going to separate the RGB around it and it's going to be uh, like frayed enough so that it might not become as, as legible as you'd like it to be. Film grain is absolutely part of this system. I totally forgot to put it down. 
um, film grain is not noise grain. So when you render your scene without a denoise, that's not the type of grain that you want because that's that's the lack of light grain, as I call it. Um, when you render your scene, you should use the denoising selection and then add film grain on top if you're doing something like that because that'll give you a much more uniform look to it without it looking kind of weird. Next is barrel distortion or lens distortion. Um, technically, there are other types like pinching distortion and mustache distortion, which is a combination of both. But for this example, I'm just doing barrel because it's the most uh, simple of effects. It is the fisheye type effect that you see in things like GoPro footage and stuff like that. Uh, it's like a typically in a very wide angle lens that this occurs, but it can happen pretty much everywhere as long as you have uh, a decent amount of like understanding of why it occurs. Um, it will distort the image in such a way that the very center of the image becomes more and more like a sphere. So if you were to, to imagine your render as a cloth and you were to drape it over a sphere, that sphere is kind of what it's doing. It's kind of bulging out the center a little bit. And because of that, it's stretching the uh, the sides inwards and outwards and so on and so forth. You should use this lightly, much like with chromatic aberration. Typically what I do is when I adjust the values, the aberration and the barrel distortion are the same value. It's technically considered a lens imperfection again. Um, and it's often corrected by a photographer, but there are certain circumstances, much like I said, you know, photographing skylines, large objects, conveying scale, that kind of stuff. Physically close renders with people typically have a little bit of barrel distortion to them. As long as you have a very wide angle shot, the low FOV and the barrel distortion makes a little bit of sense. Streaks, glare, and flares. These things are awesome. I love these things a lot. Um, typically the more cinematic looking, I'm sure you've seen a movie like a JJ Abrams movie before, and it's like, we've got these really cool lens flares all over the screen and they're all like anamorphic and cool, which I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. Um, streaks and flares occur when the source of light hits the lens at an off axis. So, um, let's say you have the sun that's very bright in the sky and you're shooting someone who is, uh, in front of the sun, the sun's rays will hit the lens at a really odd angle. And what you're seeing in the lens flare is that light bouncing into the camera sensor and then bouncing back out onto the inside of the glass of the lens. So instead of it hitting the outside of the glass and going into the sensor, it's bouncing around and hitting the inside of the glass, then finally coming back into the sensor. So again, it is technically an imperfection or an anomaly, but we want these things because they give more realism. Um, using moderation as well, uh, light leakage, light streaks, flares and glares and stuff like that. These things are really, really useful. They look really cool, but it's very easy to go overboard with them. And you can sacrifice some of your legibility sometimes when you do go overboard. You can always have a look, especially with all of these examples, Google them, you know, sit down, have a Google, have a look at what they look like in different photographers, uh, like pictures and stuff like that. And I guarantee you'll get a feel of where they should be in terms of intensity and how much. So finally, on to action. You guys will like this too. I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is how you should pose this is how you should do this, so on and so forth. Instead, I decided to focus this area on very basic things that people tend to forget, but are also very important. So hands, Rue, what are hands? You know, what, what are hands? Why are you talking about hands? You know, they're just hands. Well, hands are a window to the soul. Um, you should think of them not just as an extension of the pose that you're making, but as a differing pose for the body. They're like mini bodies, you know, they're like, they're like mini people. And you can manipulate those people into getting a more consistent emotional tone. Or in the case of certain expressions, you can convey emotion a lot more clearly with hands. 
the interaction with different media, whether skin or cloth or any kind of solid surface grounds the piece in a very convincing manner. It may be worth thinking about spending time on your hands and their poses because they are we are, as humans, naturally drawn to hands and what they are doing. This is why when artists take the time to sculpt in skin deformation, you know when like someone's fingers grabs like a butt or something like that and it like has like the marks in the cheeks and stuff like that or in the skin we see that and we internalize it as you know that's realistic because that's what happens in real life um it makes the pose feel a lot more realistic you're seeing visually the the hands and the fingers are interacting with the body on a more complex basis than just clipping inside it's totally okay and i can i cannot stress this enough Go ham with your hands. Get crazy with it. Get unorthodox. Do some weird stuff with them. Um, obviously, don't go off the rails and pose them in broken configurations. But what I mean is do cool things with them, even if they don't technically make you know sense. Um, accentuating the subconscious poses that we do. For example, I talk with my hands a lot. Obviously, you can't see it, but I am talking with my hands. Um, the way that we talk with our hands, the way that we express ourselves through our hands and stuff like that. Um, these are fantastic utilities. You should always accentuate your hand poses because they, they convey so much. A good example of this, and I'll get into it and you'll see the render in a moment. But when I did my Pan Am shower render, the typical subconscious response to being cold is to have your index and your pinky finger raise up above the rest because you are you are wet, you're cold, right? You're trying to shake this kind of stuff off. And so you kind of have this weird, almost like devil horn style of hand gesture. And I did that and I also exacerbated the, uh, the fingers in response to that and it resulted in a really cool effect. As a fun fact too, uh, I just thought I'd put this in here uh, to think about this. For those that are having trouble with posing hands and stuff like that, a lot of finger posing styles came from comic books and witches, believe it or not. Uh, yes, witches, like burn at the stake witches. A lot of the time, the only thing that differentiates a person in terms of a witch or like spell casting or anything else like that is the way that they move their hands. And if you take a look through media and stuff like that, you know, um, whether someone has like long nails or they have a very specific hand style when they cast something. It's these differences that play into this kind of emotion. Um, obviously, as I put here, depending on how the nails look or the position of the hands in different ways when casting, it conveys a different type of emotion compared to others. You know, if her nails are black and the ends of her fingers are black and she's got them jutting out in interesting ways, that's going to be much different to someone that's just casting a simple fireball spell and the hand is open as if to throw a baseball. You see what I mean? So it may not be 100% intuitive, but thinking of hands like casting spells and thinking about what emotion would be coming from that hand as a spell sometimes kind of works. I found that it does work a little bit, although I don't use it that often anymore. It might be useful to you. I don't know. But it's just one of those things and one of those quirks. Next is S-curves. You guys love posing people and making renders of single figures. And I know you guys do. And I know that some of you really struggle sometimes with making poses that are simple look complex. Uh, especially with like moving the hips, moving the collars, moving the, the shoulders and stuff like that. It's a very complex system. If you're ever having trouble making a character feel more dynamic or realistic, S-curves allow you to change that static look into a more dynamic and interesting pose. You should imagine the main body and the limbs as one big curve, and as long as all four limbs and the main body complement each other, they typically come together to form something greater. As an example, a lot of feminine characters will move their hips out to one side and shift their weight onto one leg. And I'm sure you've seen that before, right? Where someone's hips will turn to the side and, and their weight will rest on one leg. Um, 
as a result of that, their shoulders and their chest will move in the opposite direction. And you can see this in the example that I put down at the very bottom. You can see how the management of the hips dictates the management of the shoulders. They are always in opposition to each other in, in these types of renders. There are times where the shoulders and the hips are in line with each other, but you'll recognize that immediately if that's what you need to do. Sometimes the curve is very sharp, sometimes the curve is very loose and minimal, but at the end of the day, these curves will allow you to change those typical standing poses where you're having trouble just making them look interesting while standing around into more interesting versions of themselves. These curves are also very interesting for things like weight distribution. If you look at the example that I put in the top left here with this female figure, um, weight distribution changes the way that the S-curves work. And so if you know a character that is going to be leaning on something or bending over in such a capacity, these S-curves will allow you to maintain that big weight distribution so that they look more realistic. In the case of leaning on something as shown in the example, most of the lines are converging on her elbow because that's where the leaning is. So the most important part, and I think this will be pretty, pretty interesting for all of you who don't do a lot of post-processing in Photoshop or anything else like that. I'm about to go into detail about how we do post-processing just in a general sense, in a, in a broad kind of thing. So, Photoshop, the camera raw filter. You heard me talk about this before. Um, it's only for Adobe users, I apologize. Um, it allows for the editing of photos in a non-destructive way. So you can go back and tweak it at any time, kind of like procedural materials. It provides an excellent sharpening filter for renders in general. I cannot stress how cool the, the, uh, the sharpening filter is in the, in the raw filter and in Photoshop. It can be quite daunting to use at first because of its tabs and features and stuff like that, but stick with it. I guarantee that like you'll be able to stylize your renders much like real photographs because other than Lightroom, people use raw filter in professional photography all the time. LUTs or lookup tables. Um, you can think of these almost like a set of instructions to recreate a color balance. I'm sure that sometimes you've been wondering like, oh, what is color balance? Like, how does that change and, and differ things, so on and so forth? Um, people think that you need like a degree in color theory to, to make your own color balances and stuff like that. That may be true for creating LUTs, but using LUTs, you can be a total idiot and you'll be just fine. I'm a total idiot and I use them all the time. All that lookup tables are is they basically tell the, the software that you're using this color should be tweaked in this way at this time in this kind of brightness. And it's basically just a set of instructions. Um, these edit your piece in interesting ways, and I'll have some examples in, in the meta uh, in further in the, in the piece. Um, I get my LUTs from multiple different places. You can buy them online in packs, but typically I stick with the default Photoshop ones because they are more than useful. There's a good selection in there. Um, they can even mimic things such as 35 millimeter film. Um, there's also other mediums that change how colors are represented, things like black and white film or old style renders, Technicolor, that kind of stuff. I use the CC version of Photoshop because I have a subscription, but I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, tweaking the intensity of these LUTs can and give can give you interesting like quirks and stuff like that that make for interesting styles. Um, if you are dissatisfied with one LUT, um, then you can always add another LUT on top of it, and you can change the blending mode for both and get a different feeling. So, how about an example then? As you can see, this is my Pan Am shower render, an absolute banger of a render. And you can see the differences between when it came out of the blender oven and what I finished with. There's a lot of differences here, but everything is relatively simple. So let's talk about it. 
Let me just take a drink here, because my mouth is fucked. That is Mickey's Fluid Painter. So, straight out the blender oven, raw images, depending on the settings and resolution, can come out pretty muddy. There's a lot of detail that can and will be lost when checking the denoising box in render settings. Even if you're someone that, like myself, I render things in 3000 by 4500 at 1200 samples, um, detail is still lost. You still lose detail even at that kind of re resolution. On a technical level, this happens because the denoising averages the light, the color, the data between pixels and smooths it out. You can think of it almost like applying like a slight blur effect to your image to remove those pixels without actually blurring the image. They're just kind of smearing the pixels around each other into a more consistent state. Post-processing is important, if nothing else, because it allows us to draw some of that detail back out into the image. And I wish I could have set up a scene for you here. I might add another scene in this before it goes live to show you the difference. But when you add that sharpening filter in Camera Raw or indeed any other pieces of media that you use to edit your photos, um, drawing that extra detail out is incredible. You get so much more like pores, like sweat areas, like details in the eyebrows and in the face, so on and so forth. The extra benefit of doing post-processing is that we can begin inserting things between this detail step to elevate our pieces, right? So as you can see here between these two, I changed the color of the image, but I also added things like a lens, like the lens effect, the dirty lens. And it's very, very slight. It's very, very minimal, but it does change the piece in a meaningful way. And you'll learn over time where you should slot these in and at what intensities you should slot these in. Because if they were all at 100% opacity, it would just blow out the image. And so you have to find the balance between the lens effects, the, the color balancing, the LUTs, the, the post-processing, so on and so forth. Lens dirt, color changes, LUTs, all of these provide ample utility for an artist to really bump up their creative edge. For myself, I use a ton of lens dirt and LUTs, as I've talked about, and uh, sometimes a render is finished and all it needs is a little bit of Photoshop instead. So um, there was a couple times where I don't need to apply a LUT, I just do a little bit of post-processing with the camera raw filter and it's done. I don't need anything else. So you don't necessarily always need all these things, but they are a handy utility to have. You can get lens dirt effects from pretty much everywhere. Um, as long as you, as long as they are of high quality, you can download them from everywhere. So, um, I think you know, like the sweet effects, like the ENBs and the reshades that are for video games and stuff like that. Those guys have a pack of lens effects that I use all the time, and indeed, I think the one that I'm using in this Pan Am render is one of them. And the reason why I use those is because like they're at stupid high resolution. They're like 6,000 by 9,000. So you're never going to worry about a situation where your lens effects are really low res. Make sure that your lens stuff is very high res, uh, like your lens dirt and stuff like that. Otherwise, it's going to look kind of strange. Does anyone have any questions about post-processing or anything else like that? Because this doesn't just apply to things like lens effects and sharpening and stuff like that. It also is things like uh, like style, like my Overwatch style and stuff like that. What is my PC build? Uh, I have a Ryzen 5900X, uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and I have an RDX 3080. It is a long discussion, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of things that you can do in post-processing. Have you ever had to contemplate between two or three post processes and find it hard to decide? Absolutely. 
all the fucking time and I hate it. I hate it always because I love all of them equally. There'll be times where I feel like I've finished a render and I'll go back and I'll make an entirely new post-processing system for it and it'll look completely different but also just as good. Yeah, that's where alts can come from. Um, I've made tons of alts in my time, but they are typically... Uh, I either don't post them or they go to Patreon. Your LUTs and your RAW should come after getting a handle on lights and composition, but you can always fix things in post. Don't rely upon it. Don't sit down and think, okay, I can make this render shit. I'll fix it in post. That's not how things roll. You should have a command of how things work in Blender first before you uh, you go into post-processing. Okay, I'll let one or two people ask a couple more questions and then uh, I will, I'll move on. The lecture will be saved somewhere, yes. Uh, it's going to be recorded. Uh, I don't really live comfortably at all as an artist. Uh, the starving artist thing is kind of a meme, but it is it is kind of true sometimes. Um, you're never going to be able to live comfortably on stuff. Uh, you know? You're never going to be able to, to make a living on just this. It's always going to be a second fiddle, a passive income source kind of thing. Uh, yeah, uh, very much so. If your materials are trash, no amount of Photoshop is going gonna, is gonna to fix it, right? You should be mindful when you're creating materials that they are set up correctly, you know? Um... Do I stick with 4K textures throughout all of my camera angles? Um, I I keep my people, the subjects that I have, at maximum quality. If it's 4 or 8K, doesn't matter. I always keep them at maximum quality. Um, the For things like background stuff, it's 2K, you know? Um, 2K textures, anything else like that. I do use the LOD system, so the further away something is, the lower texture resolution it is, because that does save on render, um, render time and render memory. But other than that, it's pretty nominal. A lot of my scenes are very simple. For example, the Pan Am render that you're looking at is one light and one character in a shower. There's not a lot going on, so there's not a lot of textures in general. With more complex scenes, yes, you do have to manage the amount of textures you're using and what size they are, because they absolutely do play a part in how much VRAM you're using. Have I thought about making my own character before? I have. I have made my own character before. If you go to my Twitter, um, I made a Fallout character. Uh, I believe someone in my in my Twitter replies called her Titania, and I think that's kind of stuck. But uh, she's beautiful. She's fantastic. I think I did a couple renders with her previously, uh, where she's got like a, I think it was like her things. Yeah, OC content is awesome. By the way, uh, I know we're kind of getting a little bit off topic, but I'll talk about it anyway. Um, like making OCs that are interesting and stuff like that. Oh my god, the 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 advertising potential and the marketing potential is great. Do consider getting into things like Daz and stuff like that, because it's awesome. It's a lot of fun. So, uh, I think what we'll do at the end is, because we are approaching the end here, we've only got like five or so slides left. Um, the At the end, I'll sit and answer any kind of questions that you want, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll do that then. So, Adobe can go fuck itself, right? The program is really good. It is really, really good, and I can't understate it in, in, in the best ways. Um, products like GIMP, Paint.net, Affinity, they do exist, and they're fantastic at replicating the stuff that Photoshop does, but um, there is like a 10% of stuff that Photoshop just does so much better because of its... Um, 
it's just it's time in the oven you know what i mean Th photoshop and adobe is 30 years old now a lot of their stuff and their systems has been through the cooker so many times that it's very um they have a lot of granular control over things and they're very non-destructive however from my experience the reason why I don't use something like GIMP over Photoshop or anything else like that is because programs like GIMP and Paint.net, they tend to apply things like contrast changes and noises and stuff like that um, very, very ham-fistedly. They're not very, you know, light on the touch with those things. And so it's very easy to go overboard. Um, the processing with these things can be a little bit different sometimes. I don't really like the way that GIMP uses its contrast, for example. I found it a little bit weird. Uh, I've heard Kirita is very good, but um, as for everything else, uh, I haven't seen too much of uh, stuff. Um, given that post-processing is very, very important, and it is something that you should be looking into, though, I, the next slide is just dedicated to alternatives. So, the Affinity Suite. Oh my god, I can't believe that there is actually something out there that does compare against Photoshop, right? Affinity Suite is the closest you're going to get to a Photoshop-like experience without paying for Adobe stuff, right? Um, there is no subscription model for the Affinity Suite. It's a one-time payment and you get everything. And you get everything forever. Just one-time payment. It's like 60 bucks just for the, uh, the, the Photoshop stuff equivalent. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Um, GIMP also at some point is getting an update 3.2 and that's going to add in things such as non-destructive editing, right? You remember what I was talking about how the camera raw filter allows you to go back and change the way that you are post-processing in real time. Uh, GIMP 3.2 will do that, but they don't currently have a release date for it. Um, the UI for GIMP is a little bit dated, but it is sometimes buggy, but it is pretty good. I think EXRs are a little bit out of the scope of this because EXRs cover things like light coloring, grading, that kind of stuff, raw to PNG, that kind of stuff. I think if I'm going to do that, I think it should be a separate talk because otherwise we're going to be here all day. Um, there's a ton of stuff that I can talk about just in the terms of post-production and post-processing. If you guys want me to, I can write a new, uh, a new talk just on post-processing and kind of do that if you guys would want. So let's move on. Um, the biggest aspect is... Not everything you see is real. Remember that what you see on Twitter and stuff like that is the final piece and not the raw render. Artists like myself do a ton of post-processing and even myself, I done, I've done so much work with hand painting and stuff like that, especially with my Overwatch stuff. I go in by hand and paint over the stuff that I've been doing because it achieves that better look. Um, you shouldn't compare yourself explicitly with the final renders that you see. And this is the reason why. It's because a lot of people will do stuff outside of Blender that make their stuff look good. Hopefully that makes sense. And I'll let you guys kind of look at this GIF because it does switch between the, uh, the edited and the non-edited version. Hopefully you guys can see that. I don't know how well the, the, the stream quality is, but hopefully it's going to be uh, of good enough quality that you can see the GIF. So, the recipe construction, the big thing, uh, and the final section of this piece, which is only a couple of slides. The recipe construction goes into things such as like your workflow and stuff like that. If you want to take nothing else away from this workshop today, uh, I want you to think about your workflow, how you produce content and that kind of stuff, right? Is there a way that you can improve that in a general circumstance? Is there something specific that you're having problems with that often feels like a mountain when you're trying to traverse it? Sometimes, as an artist, you know, you can have everything right, but if your workflow is wrong, you don't produce any content. You're too lazy, you're not doing stuff, you're not holding yourself to any specific standards, so you don't produce anything. 
Um, you must also think about where does your artwork come from? You know, is it a consistent schedule? Is it spur of the moment? Is it something that just happens randomly and stuff like that? Whatever the case may be, we all have our vices in the end, and there's no right or wrong workflow to use when you're producing content. You just have to have that understanding of how you produce it in order to, you know, move forward with how you produce stuff and improve that. For the longest time as an artist, and this is a little bit personal, um, I would make my renders between like 2 and 5 a.m. Because that was the only time when I got some peace and quiet and I could actually focus on the stuff that I was doing. Obviously, that's not beneficial to anyone's health, and so I had to stop it eventually. Um, but it allowed me to isolate every other circumstance when I was working on my stuff so that I didn't get distracted or anything else like that. Um, it helped me produce better work because I, I was focused so much. Now in the present day, today, um, I feel much more comfortable making stuff in the daylight and uh, in the mornings and stuff like that. However, there was a bit of transitionary period when I, when I realized that. Um, all of us have a certain dance or a certain rhythm when it comes to making stuff. No one in here is the same as another person. Your jam, as I typically put it, um, should be something that you are comfortable with doing on a regular basis. So whether it's just six hours a week or three hours a week or just spending time after college or university to sit down and, and scribble away or something like that, that's totally fine. That is your rhythm sometimes. Um, the only thing that I should mention is that it should separate your life and your work as much as possible so that you can make clear stuff. So the niche with the funny dog picture. Um, I know a lot of people have been thinking about niches and stuff like that because when you've rounded the hurdle of starting out and now you're producing content full time or at least part time in your spare time, it can be very difficult to talk about the niche because not a lot of people know what their niche is or how to make a niche or what is a niche. Generally speaking, at least to what most artists would consider a niche, it is the style, it is the type of renders that you do, and it is the type of content that you produce overall. You can almost think about your niche as a brand. You know, it's something that uniquely identifies you and separate from other people. If you remember way back when we first started this talk, I talked about how the artists that we showed, it's very clear that it's their art. You know, you can blur it, you can remove their watermark. It still looks like their art. They have that style with them. For myself, you know, if you were to break down my my uh, my style, my niche, you might say that I have a lot of pinups, a lot of single character focus, you know, a lot of interesting camera angles and effects and stuff like that. If you're just starting out, you shouldn't worry about your needs too much. Um, however, if you are someone who has been producing content for a while, which is what this workshop is aimed at, then you should start to consider what your niche is. Do you really have one or do you already have one? You know, do you only have bits and pieces of a niche and you're not quite sure of where that niche should go? In the case of the latter, it may be time to scroll through and take some time to pick up, pick out key things that you enjoy the most about making content, whether that's showing bodies, doing fooder content, making animations, so on and so forth. Sometimes it's just as simple as my niche is the colors that I use, the poses that I make, or the feelings I want to introduce, that kind of stuff. The important thing to remember is that the niche within your art is typically a shared passion between yourself and the people that consume your content, so your followers. If you're ever unsure as to what people like about your stuff, you can always do things like asking questions on Twitter, making polls, making discussions. They are all pretty decent ways of finding out what sticks to people with your renders. Can your niche be a single character? Absolutely. KissX3D only does Lara stuff, and he is absolutely awesome for it. I think he's posted like one or two things with different characters, but for a lot of his stuff, it's Lara stuff. It's pretty cool. So the algorithm, this big, scary robot thing that dictates whether or not 
you're a good artist on Twitter. Um, nobody, not even the Twitter developers, really know how the algorithm works. You know what I mean? There are certain qualities that we're aware of and certain sections of things that we can make educated guesses at, but for the most part, no one knows what's going on. Um, the changes that they're making to the algorithm, which I'm going to talk about in a second, they are very much just off and on random. They change things here and there, and then they revert them. Um, in general, though, and this is something to always watch out for, when you're posting art on Twitter, Twitter will categorize your content and it will put you with similar people that make the same content. So if you mainly make animations, it will put you in the animations category with a group of people that make similar animations, so on and so forth, right? And uh, this also goes for things like still artists and stuff like that. If you make images, you'll be put into the image category and so on and so forth. It's really fucking dumb, and I apologize that this isn't different, but um, if you branch out, if you try something new, it will downplay that content. So, for example, I'm fully aware that I'm going to go back to talking about my co and my content here, but uh, this past Wednesday, I made a post with a Lara Croft render, right? And for the last couple weeks, my posts have been getting consistently about 11, uh, 1100 likes and about 25,000 views. But because my Lara render was so different to the stuff that I was producing, it got like 2000 views and like less than 150 likes. And that's kind of embarrassing for someone like me, you know what I mean? Someone who's got like this really nice high engagement rate just suddenly crashes into the ground because the algorithm dictated that a render was, you know, different or not bad. I don't know about other platforms. I've seen people repost my work onto Reddit and stuff like that, but I don't post it myself. I tend to stay away from Reddit because it scares me and it's a little bit weird. <laughs> if your content doesn't fit within the sphere of influence that you have for yourself, um, the algorithm will downrank it and make that post less visible, like I said, right? Unfortunately, sometimes the algorithm gets this wrong. It gets it very wrong. And a post that is actually part of your typical day-to-day -day posts will just not get the likes and retweets that it deserves. That is not your fault. That is the fault of the algorithm. And you shouldn't worry about it too much. Just keep making content. And I guarantee you it'll fix itself. Um, that's the same as what happened with my Lara render. You know what I mean? Obviously, we also have to contend with things such as the search suggestion ban and a search ban, which some of people have uh, talked about. For those that are unaware, a search suggestion ban is where the content that you're posting isn't promoted as much or put out into search suggestions. Um, a search ban, however, is when you cannot find your account at all, right? The only way that you can access your account or see your account with a search ban is if someone types in your full username with the at and presses enter and it will take you to your page. Otherwise, that search ban will wipe you off the map. Luckily, the search ban only happens every once in a while, typically because uh, you've posted a bad word or something like that. Um, search suggestion bans only occur. Uh, they are permanent. Search suggestion bans are permanent. Um, and they will happen naturally. As you get bigger as an artist on Twitter, you will get your search suggestion ban and it'll stick with you. But don't worry about it too much. It's not too bad uh, in the grand scheme of things. It's the search ban that's the big issue. Um, the only recommendations I have for contending with the Twitter algorithm is just post consistently, reply to people, retweet other people's art and stuff like that. Um, maintaining a presence on the platform is really good because it keeps the algorithm thinking about you. You know what I mean? So sometimes you'll post a piece of art and it'll go straight into the floor because the algorithm hasn't picked it up. But because you've been replying to people and because you've been active in the community, other people will come and find that post and kind of prop it up slightly with their interactions and things. Um, I don't follow this typically. Um, I'm someone who's very anxiety prone, and so I don't tweet too much on my Twitter account because I'm a little bit nervous, you know what I mean? I don't, I kind of get anxiety when I try and post something, 
I get a lot of post anxiety actually, but um, absolutely. Don't be afraid of doing retweets and stuff like that because they help a lot with the algorithm and with your presence, you know? Um, it's good to keep a presence and post at the same time, but if you can only post, don't worry about it. Just, you know, interact when you can. Retweet people's posts, that kind of stuff. If you search your username and nothing shows up, you are search banned, absolutely. Um, you can also check. There is a, uh, a shadow ban checker, which Norn has just showed. That will show you whether or not you have a search suggestion ban or a search ban. Uh, the video will be available wherever Anime Nyan puts it, so uh, yeah. I, I had a search ban after I posted my trace surrender because I put boobies in the title, um, but uh, it was lifted recently. I only have a search suggestion ban now, which is normal. Um, there is a big difference between the suggestion ban and the search ban. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Lastly, and this is the big thing, um, engagement, you know? Uh, I'm sure all of you are practically aware by now that Elon Musk is like, you know, uh, basically running Twitter into the ground and stuff like that. While there's nothing that we can do, uh, I'm, I'm sure none of you necessarily want to post and purchase Twitter blue stuff, right? You don't want to give money to that cunt. <clears throat> Strong word, I know, I apologize. Um, if you have other content creators that you're interacting with, whether as an art trade or just by retweeting their work, you gain a sense of momentum outside of your own reach. So you can think of it almost like ripples in a, in a, in a lake. When you post something, you drop a stone in, it makes those ripples outwards. Um, when someone retweets your post, those ripples hit their rock and it bounces off and it sends them further away. And that kind of stuff. Um, so team up. That's the general sentiment. Find people that make similar content to you. Team up. Retweet each other's stuff. You know, interact with each other on Twitter. Share memes. Do stuff. You know, when you have this kind of fluid posting activity outside of just posting your renders and stuff like that, it's a lot easier for people to find you and, and like your content and stuff like that. Um, posting works in progress, posting, uh, everything in between the work in progress stage to the final piece is always important, like I said. So as the last kind of sentiment to kind of wrap this whole thing up, uh, do stuff on the internet, go on Twitter, go on slushy, post content, that kind of stuff, but also, um, get together, do art trades. Uh, like each other's content, retweet each other's content, take care of each other, because it's those likes and retweets sometimes that save a piece when it comes to like retweeting each other's stuff. You're exposing your content and other people's content to a vast array of people, and the chances are that you're going to find someone who retweets your work, and a lot of people are going to like it. Yeah, be homies, example, making friends in the community and stuff like that. A lot of people might be scared to make friends in the community, and I was too when I first started and stuff like that, but I guarantee you this Discord is the best place for it. You guys are awesome, right? You guys talk to each other all day and stuff like that. People are in VC a lot of the time. Feel free to hop in, talk to people, have a conversation and stuff like that, because I guarantee you, you'll get a follower or two out of it. You know, you'll start talking to people in, uh, in interesting circumstances. So, lastly, Thank you for being here. I know it was a very, very long speak, you know? There was a lot of information to take in and I implore you and I thank you so much for uh, sticking around and stuff like that. Um, tag me in any posts that you make, you know? If you learn something from this and stuff like that, uh, let me know. Tag me in a post or something like that and I'll happily retweet it and shit. Um, I will sit here now. I'll stop streaming in a second and we can answer some questions and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so, oh my God, thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are fantastic. I don't know whether it was obvious or not, but I am kind of nervous. There was a lot of people that turn up and stuff like that, this being the, the largest workshop that we've ever done. So uh, hopefully this was insightful. 
uh, a lot of really good information and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you know, am I British? Yes, unfortunately, I, it's terminal. <laughs> Unfortunately, being British is terminal. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop streaming now. Uh, there you go. So this will just be like the rest of the thingy now. I think I can stop recording at this point. I think we can just jot down the questions that we have, uh, like the the FAQs and stuff like that, and we can make a written thing that I'll add to the workshop afterwards. So if you guys have any questions or anything else like that, I'll happily answer them, and we can collect them later and uh, and doing stuff. So. I saw a question a second ago. Um...